this time on the 757 at 6 on ESPN Radio 94.1. We're joined by a special guest. You can read his Nationals pastime column on MassInSports.com. Give him a follow on Twitter, too, at Mark Zuckerman. We're joined by the Nationals beat reporter Mark Zuckerman with us here on the program. Uh, Mark, baseball is back. Got to feel good about that, huh? Yeah, you do, but there's so many complications to it, and it's it's not baseball the way we're used to seeing it, certainly. And, And last night... Opening night Nationals Park was it was a weird vibe. It did not feel normal. It, it was uh, a strange scene in a lot of ways because of no fans, because of raising a banner and a, and a pennant without anybody there, and then obviously the rain delay that then ended the game in the sixth inning. So it it, it felt really strange. But you know, one down. Hopefully they can find some sense of, of normalcy here, and, and they'll be playing more games to come. And you're right there in the nation's capital, right there at the heart of it. I'm watching from my television at home and hearing the sounds and no fans. It's kind of an eerie feeling, so I can only imagine what you're going through. And I want to kind of dig in there before we talk about the team a little bit here in the season. How about for a guy like you, the way you cover the team, take us a bit behind the curtain of how different it is this year compared to past seasons. Well, yeah, it's really different. The main thing is that we really don't have any access to the players, the manager, the clubhouse anything like that. Uh, typically, we would be in the clubhouse you know, for a good hour in the afternoon talking to players before they head out for batting practice to be on the field while they're taking batting practice. We could have an interview with the manager after the game, again with the manager, and back in the clubhouse to interview players. Well, now we're doing it all on Zoom, you know, teleconferences, even though we're in the ballpark with them. So we're in the press box. We're spaced out. Nobody's allowed to be you know, more than six feet from each other. And we're all looking at our computer screens and interviewing guys who are in the building, but not allowed to be anywhere near us. So, I mean, it it does really change the way that we do our job. Now, you know, I'm grateful for the fact that I'm able to be there and and see the game with my own eyes and hopefully report on some things that people aren't seeing on TV. But uh, it it, it changes a lot about how we, we try to do our jobs. And, you know, the hope is that this is a temporary thing. This won't be long term. But for now, we kind of have to get used to this new normal. For this season, and it's a condensed year, and we'll get into some of that, do you feel like the pressure's off the team because they finally climbed the mountain and won the championship? And with the phrase freebie year, we've heard it with other teams and other sports, we've heard it even with the Chicago Cubs after they won their World Series. Is that appropriate to use and throw towards the Nationals this year? Well, I know they don't personally feel that way, but I think it's completely appropriate for anyone on the outside to look at it that way, uh, especially the, the circumstances of this season. If it's a normal 162-game season, then you saying, hey, you still have Scherzer and Strasburg and Corbin and Soto and everyone else on that team. Yeah, there should be some pressure to, to try to win and show the last year wasn't a complete fluke. But this year is so odd, the circumstances are so strange, that to me, if they don't make the playoffs, although now it's going to be really hard not to make the playoffs with 16 teams all of a sudden in it, and I don't think anyone, I don't think if you're a Nats fan, you can truly be that upset you know, buy it. You want them to play well. You don't want them to completely fall apart, anything like that. But throughout this whole process, I, I, I just the same thought has been coming to my mind. Like, thank God they won it last year, because can you imagine if they had had another one of those playoff heartbreaks, and now you're coming into this year and saying, boy, this may be one of our last chances to win the whole thing. Guys are getting older. We don't know how long we can keep this core group together. And then to have the season change the way that it has, that would be a lot of pressure and, and probably wouldn't feel so good for them. So I, I think there's definitely have to be a feeling of, okay, they got their championship, that's great. Whatever happens now this year would, would kind of be gravy. Boy, you're so right. The word that comes to mind is relief. And they had three chances to potentially have it go the other way with the Brewers, the Dodgers, and, of course, that World Series with the Houston Astros. We're talking with the guy that covers the Nets up close and personal, Mark Zuckerman of MassInSports.com here on the 757 at 6 on ESPN Radio 94.1. And to go a step further, I mean, the talk of how do you replace an Anthony Rendon? Can it be done individually or collectively for this club? We know about Juan Soto testing positive yesterday. In your eyes, does this team go as far as their starting pitching carries them? It certainly starts with that, and that's really the way they've been built for a long time now. Um, Mike Rizzo, had, his background was with the Diamondbacks, and, and until last year, the only team he'd ever worked for that won a World Series was 2001, the Diamondbacks. And how did they win it? With Kirk Schilling and Randy Johnson. Mm-hmm. And so he's sort of always in his mind had that philosophy of that's how you build a championship team with great starting pitching, and, and certainly they have that. Yeah, they're going to go as far as that group takes them. Now, that said, we've seen over the years here that you need more than that. You need clutch hitting, certainly, and they had that tremendous amount of that late last season in the playoffs. 
I need to have a bullpen that can at least you know close down the games that you that you lead late. And I think that is still a, a question mark for this team. They're hoping that Sean Doolittle and Daniel Hudson and now Will Harris, who they uh, brought in from the Astros, the guy who gave up Howie Kendrick's homer in the World Series, uh, that they can solidify that group and make it so it's not an issue for them all year long. But there are depth issues there. They have to be careful early in the season not to burn these guys out because they haven't been, uh, you know, had a chance to build their arms up the way you normally would in spring training. And every loss this year is magnified because you're only playing 60 games. So the bullpen blows, you know, two or three games that were winnable. That's going to mean more this year than it did a year ago. So it starts with the starting pitching, but then they need all the other stuff to come together too to actually pull off, you know, close victories. You just hit on it there, Mark, the 60-game uh, slate, each game in series feeling more magnified. Does the strategy change with that added sense of urgency? And what about Davey's approach along that line of thought? Yeah, I think it, there's a, kind of a fine balance he has to strike here. You know, he wants to do whatever he can to try to win that day's game, and that may mean using whoever's available, pushing a pitcher to go a little farther. But he also has to acknowledge that, especially early on, like I was saying, guys haven't had time to build their arms up yet the way you would want. Right. The worst thing can happen right now would be an injury because, again, we're talking about being magnified, you know, a, a 10 days on the injured list in a 162-game season is not as damaging. 10 games out of 60, that's a lot. And we're just assuming it's only 10. If you have a more serious injury, you're missing a month or more. That's a huge portion of your season. So I do think you're going to have to be careful at times to not overuse guys, to understand there may be a game here or there that you have to say, you know what, do little Hudson have pitched too much lately, I need to hold back on them, not pitch them tonight, save them for tomorrow. That could cost them a game on any given day, but hopefully it would help them in the long run. So I do think it's a little bit of a tricky balance that he's got to strike there between going all in on winning that day's game versus making sure that guys are, are healthy for the whole season. Uh, good point. We know how much the bullpen has been a daily adventure the past few years, and we did see how it stepped up at times in the postseason last year, particularly our local guy here of Princess Anne High School and Old Dominion fame, Daniel Hudson, there at the back end. The uh, bullpen there, Mark, is it a concern or not so much this year? It's not as much of a concern as it was a year ago, but I think it still is a concern. I mean, okay. you know, it would be hard for them to duplicate what they did last year over the regular season. They were statistically one of the worst bullpens of all time. So that's not going to happen again. But there really are a lot of question marks there. Doolittle dealt with injuries last year. He was only throwing the other night in his exhibition game, 88, 89 miles an hour. He's still trying to find it. Hudson looked good in the exhibition season, as it were. But he's a guy who, as good as he was for them last year, believe me, they don't win the World Series without him. There were questions about whether they should re-sign him because, historically, he had not been that kind of pitcher. He'd been far more inconsistent in his career. So they're hoping that he can duplicate it, but his track record has, hasn't suggested that that's a sure thing. Uh, and then Will Harris is a guy who has a good track record with Houston for several years now, but he's 35 years old, and with relievers, you just never know how long they're going to hold up. So those are the big three. They need more depth behind them to consistently help uh, bridge the gap from the starters to the back-end guys. But they don't have to have a great bullpen. They just need to have an average bullpen because that'll be a huge improvement from last year. And if they can do that, I think it'll make a difference, and they have enough else in their rotation, obviously, to overcome that. One more with you on one of the franchise's cornerstones, and I'll couple, go a couple big-picture ones with you here, talking with Mark Zuckerman of MadisonSports.com here on the 757 at 6 on ESPN Radio 94.1. Give him a follow on Twitter at Mark Zuckerman. And we're talking about uh, Ryan Zimmerman. We've uh, mentioned him before when we had you on the show uh, out of Kellum High School in Virginia Beach, UVA. We know he's not playing this season. Your thoughts if we've seen the last of Zimmerman in a Nats uniform and in the big leagues in general? You know, I know he believes that he's still got a lot left in him. Uh, he was adamant about that over the winter and this spring. Uh, he made a decision that I think is completely rational, given his family situation. They just had a, a baby a few weeks ago. His mother, as I'm sure you guys know, has MS and has had that since he was a, a young boy. Mm -hmm. um, he's got to make sure they're taken care of. And in his, the situation that he's in in his career completely makes sense and is understandable why he didn't want to take the risk this year. I think he does believe he can keep playing. I think the Nationals will believe that as long as he's healthy, uh, that there will be a spot for him. He, he was coming back on a very low-end deal this year. It was $2 million plus incentives. So he's not looking for a big payday. The only question I have, and there's just no way to know this, and I'm sure he doesn't know the answer to this either, is once he sits out a whole year and he sees what that's like, will he think to himself, 
boy, I really miss it. I really want to get back to that again. Or will they think, you know, you know what, this isn't so bad. I don't mind this. My body feels good. I don't have to put in all those hours every day uh, to keep myself in shape to play. I'm enjoying being with my family. Maybe that does strike him as, uh, you know, not such a bad thing. And if he could walk out in his final game is, is winning a World Series, that's a pretty good place to be. I think it's more likely he tries to come back, but until he goes through this year and really sees what it's like, uh, I think it's, it's hard to say how he's really going to feel. Yeah, very true. The new playoff format, you touched on it now, 16 teams. Uh, what's your feeling on it? You like it, don't like it, kind of in between? What's your take? I, you know, my initial impression is I don't like it at all. And it's not just that I'm a traditionalist. I just feel like in any sport, because you're going to have more than half of the teams reaching the postseason, then all you've done now is make the regular season far less meaningful. And one of the best things I think baseball has going for it is that in a, in a normal season, 162 games, you have to prove you're the best team. And by the end of the 162, you've earned it. And if you don't get there and you finish in second or third place, you, you didn't earn it. And now, pretty much if you have a winning record or potentially even one or two teams with losing records, is going to get in. So I, I don't love that. I really don't like the pick-your-opponent aspect that we've heard about for this. That just seems totally contrary to how we think about sportsmanship in general. I mean, why would you want to give a team reason to think that you disrespect them because you picked them to play against in the playoffs? So I don't love that. But in a broader sense, I think MLB is a little misguided in that they seem to believe that more playoffs means more eyeballs and higher ratings. And to me... It's such a, a, an investment of time and emotion to watch the entire baseball postseason. If they want higher ratings, to me, fewer games is the answer. Make each game more meaningful that way, and maybe more people will tune in. The reason the wild card games have been so popular is because everyone knows, hey, this is it. One game, go home. And then you get to the next round, and it stretches out a little bit, and I think you see the ratings go down a little bit. So I get why they're doing this. This isn't about fairness. This isn't about giving the most teams the opportunity or anything like that. This is about money. They're trying to recoup the money they're losing this year, and I understand why they're doing that. But from a competitive standpoint, I I really don't like it. I hope this is a one-off. They just do it this year, but I I worry that it's going to become a permanent thing. Yeah, I'm with you totally. The only thing that I even like a little bit would maybe be you could convince me the three game as opposed to the one game for the first rounds are right. But going to more than half the field getting in and then the pick your opponent thing is crazy. That almost is like something you do doing dodgeball. I just don't like that yeah, totally right. at all. And hopefully it's just a one year thing here. And I get they want to do some experiment, get some more fan answers drummed up, and it is a condensed year. But who knows? Um, lastly, Mark, and we appreciate the time. Look forward to getting you back on the show. Uh, how do you view the NL East this year? It feels like there's four teams that can contend with the reigning champs, the reigning division champs in Atlanta. Atlanta, Mets and Phillies. Mets have some arms. Phillies have obviously the former Nat Great and Bryce Harper. Um, how do you view the division big picture? Yeah, I think it's wide open. I think there's a, a scenario in which any one of the four could win it. And I'd even say the Marlins, while they're not going to win the division, I think are going to be much improved. And there, There's a, a lot of legitimate young talent there. And they can impact the race just from the games that they're playing against mm-hmm. the other teams. I think the Braves and the Nats are kind of a step above the others in that I think they can both afford to have one or two things go wrong and still win, whereas I think the Phillies and Mets kind of need everything to go right. I don't think they're quite built with the depth to, to be able to withstand some of those other things happening, them, whether it's injuries or, or poor performance by somebody they were counting on. But in a 60-game season, and when you're only playing each other, you're not playing teams from the other divisions at all, other than the American League East. It's all going to be head-to-head, and and you win a couple key games, and that can flip the standings completely. So it would not shock me if any one of those four won it, but I I do feel like the Braves and the Nats have a a slight advantage just because of their depth. He's Mark Zuckerman of MassInSports.com. Again, follow him on Twitter at Mark Zuckerman, giving you the best when it comes to covering the Washington Nationals and Major League Baseball. Thank you so much, my friend. We'll keep in touch. You stay safe, and we'll talk down the road, all right? Okay, my pleasure. Thank you.